Okay, good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. We do have a few people still logging in. I'm Lee McDonald, Deputy Superintendent for the West Windsor Plainsboro Regional School District. I want to welcome you to our parent university. Obviously, tonight's focus is on child and adolescent anxiety. Uh, part of my role in the district is overseeing pupil services, which would include uh, our school counselors, our child study teams, and certainly working with our Rutgers University behavioral health clinicians. We're very fortunate in WWP to have a partnership uh, for quite some time now uh, with Rutgers University behavioral support. Uh, we have school-based clinicians that work in our schools, mostly at the middle school and high school level, that support our students in times of crisis, uh, support our mental health needs and challenges, uh, so certainly support our school counselors, child study teams, administration, teachers, and whatnot. So they're an invaluable resource to us as a district and certainly to our students and our families that we serve. Uh, so it's an honor to be here tonight, stepping in for Jessica Smedley, our Director of Counseling, uh, who was unable to attend. Um, tonight's presentation is going to cover a lot, uh, needless to say. Uh, this is certainly uh, a hot topic remains so, uh, as somebody that has two teenagers at home, uh, two children of my own, uh, certainly had my own personal experiences. We, we all face uh, different points in our life where we have heightened anxiety. So uh, our clinicians are going to dive into what anxiety is, how it impacts children, certainly talk about healthy coping mechanisms, how you can manage this at home, how you can partner with us as a district in supporting your children uh, when they do have uh, bouts of anxiety or just day-to-day -day, uh, functioning uh, and mm -hmm. so forth. So with that being said, I am going to turn it over to our UBAC clinicians who will introduce themselves and get the presentation started. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. So my name is Therese Salo. I'm uh, the newest clinician at the West Windsor Plainsboro School District, and I work at the high school cell. And presenting with me today is also another clinician. She's over in one of the middle schools. Um, Natalia, did you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our presentation. As Therese already mentioned, my name is Natalia Pietrowskaya, and I am the clinician working in community middle school. Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, thank you so much for being with us here tonight. And we are excited to, to do Parent University. And what we have uh, planned for you today is a presentation about identifying and supporting students with anxiety. Um, as Lee mentioned before, we are employed by Rutgers UBHC, and what we do is we're able to provide on-site crisis intervention and screening. We're able to help link uh, students and families to, to mental health services in the community. We're able to collaborate with other mental health providers that may be working with some of the students in the district. Um, and we're also able to provide mental health awareness and education like tonight. Um, something else we are able to provide in terms of services is we're able to do consultation and support um, for the school staff and the faculty. And we're also able to help assist with referrals. Hold on one second. It is okay, so one of the sides. Oh, that's the correct side. Correct slide. Okay. okay, so this slide is a busy slide, and that's the reason why we picked it. Um, and what it kind of shows us is that um, anxiety disorders are the most common mental health disorder in the United States. And anywhere from one in 10 people suffer from anxiety, with about 8% of children and teenagers experiencing an anxiety disorder. And this has worsened since the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's obvious that we're living in more times of stress and anxiety than ever before. And that's the reason why we picked this topic and we wanted to present it to you tonight. So the agenda for tonight, we, as you, as you can tell in the, the slide, uh, what we hope to do is really just 
help make sense of youth anxiety because it is very common. It's prevalent in our youth today. So we're going to go over um, what is anxiety. We're going to talk about the epidemic of youth anxiety and some of the reasons why it is so much higher now. Um, we're going to talk about the warning signs and symptoms um, of anxiety and some of the types of stress that our youth experience today. We're also going to share about how you can support and help um, your anxious youth at school, in the classroom, and at home. And then we will review some strategies and resources and interventions that are commonly used to treat anxiety in youth. Okay, so according to the National Institute of Mental Health, approximately 25% of 13 to 18 year olds have an anxiety disorder and just under 6% have a severe anxiety disorder. So what this speaks to is that the teen years are ripe with new experiences, opportunities and challenges. And also during this time, we know that the teenagers brains are changing. So they want more independence, they want autonomy. And during this time, there's also so many stressors that they can encounter. So for example, teens may worry about looking a particular way, uh, trying to fit in with their friends, final exams, schoolwork, getting into college, performing in sports. Um, and on top of that, we have social media, which can add a whole nother layer of stress to this. Um, to their world. Okay. So one in six U.S. children aged two to eight years old, and that's about 17.4%, had a diagnosed mental, behavioral, and or developmental disorder. Um, and the reason why we included this slide is because mental, behavioral, and developmental disorders begin in early childhood. So knowing this and having this information can help us to pay attention to warning signs so that we can provide early intervention right away. Okay. Um, in, this, in this graph, uh, these statistics are, are very telling as well. So it explains how teenagers see depression and anxiety as a major problem. Um, as you can see, they identify with it 70%, more so than bullying, drug addiction, drinking alcohol, teen pregnancy, and gangs. So feeling anxious is a part of the normal range of emotions, just like feeling angry or embarrassed. And anxiety in teenagers, we know, is not always a bad thing. Um, in fact, it can help them, right? It can help them to try to stay safe, help them to prepare for situations and motivate them. But for most teens, uh, what we know is anxiety doesn't last and it can go away on its own. But for some teens, it can get so intense um, where it can actually impact their daily functioning, meaning their ability to go to school, to be around people, um, everyday things. And that's what we wanna try to identify. So what we thought would be helpful is um, before we even start getting into what anxiety is and what it looks like, uh, we thought it would be important to talk about what is stress. So stress is often and that's why we're gonna go over it today. Um, and we're going to try to cover the difference between both stress and anxiety um, so that you're able to look out for that. So as you can see here, stress is a state of tension related to your body attempting to cope with its environment. It's the body's way of preparing to deal with a tough situation, and it's normal. Uh, the stress response involves the nervous system and specific hormones in the body and it can also help to enhance our ability to perform under pressure as well as avoid danger. So it's there for a reason. Um, stress is individualized and it affects everyone in a very unique way. 
So that's something to keep in mind. Um, in the next slide, what you see here is we all know that stress is normal as we talked about, and we know that we can't escape it. It's just part of life. Um, if we don't learn how to manage stress, what can happen is it can get it can get worse and it can start to impact our functioning in many different ways. So it can show up in our behaviors where we may not even be aware that we're overeating or we're not eating. Um, sometimes we, because we're so stressed, we might turn to alcohol and drugs. Um, some people will start to withdraw socially. Some people will bite their nails out of habit. They're not even aware of that. Uh, physically, what it can look like is um, the person might complain of feeling tired all the time. They might start having trouble with sleep, not being able to fall asleep, stay asleep, and get a good night's rest. They might have uh, physical complaints such as stomach aches, chest pain, uh, muscle pain, headaches. All of those somatic complaints could be physical complaints related to stress. That's too much. Um, it can also look like indigestion, a weakened immune system, and um, also some nausea and increased sweating. Emotionally, what it can look like is maybe um, they're not feeling very motivated lately. So for some people that can look like they might be getting lazy when in fact they're just under so much stress. They might um, look like they're very irritable or angry. Um, they might feel depressed and sad, restless. They might have trouble focus and concentrating. Um, they might verbally say they're feeling overwhelmed often and then feeling nervous and jumpy. These are all signs of prolonged stress. So what is anxiety? Anxiety, um, now we're gonna talk about that. Anxiety is a feeling of worry, nervousness or unease about something with an uncertain outcome. It's a feeling of apprehension and fear characterized by physical symptoms such as palpitation, sweating, feelings of increased stress. Um, that's how our body will respond. It's also a norm, normal human feeling of fear that we all experience when faced with something threatening or difficult. It can help us to avoid dangerous situations, um, meaning that it can help make us alert, give us some motivation to deal with problems. But the caveat here is if these feelings of anxiety are too strong, it can actually stop us from doing the things we want. So anxiety for some people it can reach a point where it can actually paralyze people from doing what they need to do. And that's how it differs from everyday stress. Um, it's continued to the next slide where some other notes about anxiety is that a person's anxiety may or may not have a clear cause. And at the same time, it could also be a typical and appropriate response. Um, with anxiety symptoms, they can fall into three categories. As we looked at before in the chart, it can show up physically, how our body responds to the feeling. It can show up in our behaviors and especially in our thoughts, our cognitions. And some common forms of anxiety can include general anxiety and worries. Um, something more intense would be phobias and panic. It could come across as obsessions and compulsions. And um, social anxiety is very common. And anxiety can also be a common reaction to trauma as well. So um, that is the difference between anxiety and stress so far. Um, hold on one second. Okay, so we're gonna sum up the difference. What's the difference? Stress like anxiety is an emotional response, as we mentioned. 
And it's usually caused by an external trigger, such as taking an exam or getting to a fight with a friend. All of that can trigger stress because it's a stressful situation. Anxiety, on the other hand, can be internally created um, by fear. So it's fear that seems to take on a life of its own. And most normal anxiety and stress can go away on its own. It can go away quickly in a matter of a few hours or so, or even a day. Um, but sometimes what happens is anxiety, if we're not able to control it or manage it, it, it can become an increasing concern when it gets so intense and it goes on for weeks at a time, months or longer. And then what we want to look out for is the type of anxiety that starts to impact a child's ability to learn, engage in home and school and work environments, and especially when it starts to impact their ability to enjoy life. Um, this is, these are those warning signs. And these are things that we can, we can really look out for in our kids so that we can get them the help they need. Okay, I'm just going to need a minute to share this video with everybody so we can watch it um, on the full screen. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm going to start a new share. Okay, Therese, could you please let me know if you can hear the video? Sure. I'm going to open full screen. The brain can be tough yes. to understand. Awesome. So let's break it down into three main parts that help guide our emotions. The first part of our brain is our smart brain, also known as our frontal lobe. Our smart brain helps us with things like reading, writing, solving problems, thinking clearly, and even with how we communicate. The second part of our brain is our emotional brain. The emotional brain is in charge of the storing and sorting of emotions and memories. The third part of our brain is the survival brain, also known as our brain stem. This part of the brain is responsible for our body's basic functions. Things like our breathing, heart rate, movement, sleep, and more. It can help our bodies respond quickly in dangerous situations to help keep us safe. But when we feel really strong emotions, our smart brain can go temporarily offline. This is so our emotional brain can focus on sending messages to our survival brain to respond as quickly as it can to help keep us safe. This can be really helpful for keeping us safe when we're in danger, like if we came across a bear and our body needed to respond quickly without having time for the smart brain to think it through. But our brain can't always tell the difference between danger and when we're just feeling really big emotions like stress. So while the smart brain turning off can be really helpful in certain situations, like needing to run away quickly from a bear or an angry dog, it wouldn't be so helpful in times when we have big emotions. In those times, we need our smart brain to help us think clearly, like when we have a test coming up or we'll have to give a speech. A big part of being able to manage our emotions is learning how to notice when our smart brain is about to switch off and finding out what we can do to keep the smart brain switched on. Okay. Thank you so much, Natalia. Great, sure. I'm yeah. going to stop sharing now and we'll get back to our presentation. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that we were able to show that video because it does a really mm -hmm. great job at explaining how anxiety 
impacts our brain and what happens in our brain when we start to feel anxious. So obviously it has a lot to do with our thoughts and perceiving some sort of threat. So, and that all of that is happening in our brain when we're feeling afraid or nervous or scared. And how do we start to switch that off, right? And that's where the coping skills is gonna come in. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later on. There are, there are actual things that um, coping skills that people can use to help control and manage the anxiety so it doesn't take over their brain and they're able to function. Okay. Um, can you bring up the slides, Natalia? Sure. For, um, we're on some causes of anxiety? Yeah. Okay. So in this slide, we wanted to touch on some of the causes of anxiety. Um, as you can see, there's no specific cause for anxiety disorders, um, just like there's no cause or one single cause for mental health problems. Several factors can play a role. Um, and they're listed there on the slide. Genetics, it can it has it has to do with brain biochemistry. It could be um, an overactive fight or flight response, which is something that uh, the video kind of touched on is if someone um, has grown up in a very chaotic childhood, their fight or flight response might be easily triggered more so than others. Um, it can be caused by too much stress. It can be because of life circumstances, and it can also be related to someone's personality. Um, people who have low self-esteem and poor coping skills may be more prone to anxiety. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, we felt this was an important slide to include as well. Um, this slide talks about the contributors to a culture of teen anxiety. Um, some of the things that can contribute is a culture of high achievement. And what that refers to is um, what the team wants, what they, you know, what they think is important to them versus maybe what the parents want and what we think they want they may all conflict. So this culture of high achievement can, can contribute to stress in many areas. Um, perfectionism, autonomy, trying to find that balance of autonomy from parents, um, school safety, and some of the social justice movements that we hear about and the fight for equal rights can, can contribute to anxiety and stress. Uh, Technological, technological changes, um, more specifically, constantly being connected on social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and it's, it's a blast of stimuli with no escape. And, you know, something that I guess is starting to come up now too, is like addiction to social media. And that's related to this um, overwhelming um, information all at once. The hurry to grow up too fast, right? Maybe wanting to leave the home, go to college, over scheduling to strive for perfection. And then another contributor is just learning how to navigate relationships and trying to develop that sense of self. Um, so all of this is what can contribute to teen anxiety today. Who is the West Windsor Plainsboro student? So we kind of wanted to just apply what we've talked about so far to the students in our district, in our community. Um, here, when we think about the WWP student, we wanna take into consideration all of the factors that are going into their lives. This can help us to understand and help them to better manage their stress so that they can succeed and move on to be healthy young adults. So as you can see, um, our students are part of a family, they're family members, they're friends, they may have a job, they may work, volunteer, they might be doing an internship while going to school, they have homework, they have band, um, a lot of them are are part of sports, participate in sports. They also have responsibilities at home that we can't ignore and that we have to acknowledge. They have chores. Um, 
Some, some of the students also participate in spiritual and cultural programs outside of school. They participate in college bound programs that involve a lot of work, time and planning. So we just want to try to keep in mind that our students are trying to navigate life the best they can. And if we're able to, you know, kind of notice some of these warning signs that we're going over, we can let them know there's support that can help them. There are things they can do to learn how to manage their stress and control these, the intense anxiety that they may experience. So when should I worry about my child's anxiety? Um, what we want to look at is, you know, we talked again about how anxiety is so normal. So how do I know when I should worry? Um, what we need to do is if it, be it becomes a problem when a child or a teen, if you notice that they start to avoid situations that trigger anxiety, that's going to be a big, a big sign to look out for. So when consider considering whether your child's anxiety is a normal response to fears or a problem, what we can do is look at three factors. And these three factors are on the slide. Um, so we can apply this slide to maybe an example of test anxiety. So a student that is very nervous and anxious about taking a test or an exam in a certain class. Um, so if that happens often and they're maybe so anxious because they think they're not smart enough, they think that they're not prepared or they are thinking to themselves they're going to fail and that's happening more and more, that's going to be a sign to look out for. In terms of duration, um, so they're not only um, expressing these irrational and disproportionate fears that are not based on facts, but it's also continuing, it's ongoing. So the time spent worrying is significantly longer than the time spent taking the test, right? That's the example. And so the child is obviously struggling to get over this fear. And the most telling sign is if, so if it's happening more than, you know, a day or so and it keeps happening and then it's going on longer and getting more intense to the point where it's starting to impact their functioning to the to where they are trying to avoid the class altogether or not go to school on the days they have a test that's what impairment is that's what it's describing so the anxiety is actually interfering with the child going to school it's interfering with their development it could also start to impact their relationships because maybe that becomes a point of contention of, of not going to school and the parents are forcing them to go to school and they're not understanding. Um, and it, it starts to take away from their everyday activities. Um, so if you notice anxiety occurring more often for longer durations and causing more avoidance, it may be time to intervene and get help. Um, so something else to look out for is if, if you notice any changes in your child's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, you can apply this slide to that. Like how frequent is it happening? Um, how long has it been happening? And is it starting to impact, you know, what they need to do their everyday living? Um, so this slide, what exactly is anxiety? And what you see on the half of the slide is what anxiety is. And the other half talks about anxiety disorders. Um, so anxiety is normal. It's a normal stress response, but not all anxiety is the same. So youth who struggle with clinical anxiety encounter interference in their daily social, academic, and home lives. That's a given. So that is one of the main things that differentiates anxiety disorders from just normal anxiety. Um, some anxieties may be short term and situational, while others are sudden and inexplicable. There may not be an explanation where it's coming from or why it's happening all of a sudden. 
So learning the difference between stress, fear, uncertainty, panic, and social anxiety can help with understanding someone's anxiety signs and symptoms. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the different types of anxiety disorders in the next slide. Um, okay, so children with anxiety, um, how it may show up for them is they may appear more clingy than normal. They may seem very restless and fidgety. They might complain of stomach aches or not feeling well. They may have changes in their eating and sleeping habits. They may often express many negative thoughts and worries. Um, they might get upset more quickly and angry. They might have um, bouts of unexplained crying and they might struggle to really focus and concentrate. Some signs that a student is struggling with anxiety. So um, this shows how anxiety can show up in the classroom or maybe even at home, right? These are some warning signs. They might look uh, distracted. They might be impulsive. Um, they may come across as on edge or defensive or agitated when you ask them a question. They, you might notice more meltdowns. They might avoid participating, maybe in family, family gatherings or social gatherings. Um, and then you might also have someone that is constantly seeking reassurance. They just wanna, they might be asking questions repetitively. Um, they may isolate and withdraw. They might also seem like they're defiant. They're just not wanting to follow the rules. Um, they may have trouble paying attention. They may have poor attendance in class, as we talked about. They might have fear of public speaking or talking in front of a group. And then you might have, you might uh, hear more somatic complaints, such as stomach aches and headaches. And then um, the student that's often feeling tired and sleepy, that could all be related to anxiety. Um, so we also wanted to point out the physical signs of anxiety. And these are symptoms of how our body responds to the high levels of anxiety. So it's so high, the anxiety, and so intense that our body is having a physical response to this emotion. And it can come across as our heart is racing. Um, it could look like excessive sweating. It could look like tremors or shakiness if they're nervous. Um, some students will say that they start to hyperventilate or they can't catch their breath. Um, they may feel dizzy and lightheaded. They may have stomach pain, headaches, GI issues, um, fatigue, and then the appetite changes as well. So those are some physical signs to just be aware of. This slide talks about the DSM, and the DSM stands for the Diagnostic and T Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And it's a handbook used by healthcare professionals in the United States and much of the world as the authoritative guide to the diagnosis of mental disorders. It contains descriptions, symptoms, and other criteria for helping to diagnose mental health problems. And it can also help guide uh, treatment interventions as well. Here, what we have are a list of the some of the common screening tools that are used to, to try to gain more understanding about a person's anxiety. So screening tools and assessments, they can be conducted at the beginning and throughout the course of one's treatment. One of the most common ones that um, is widely used, and in fact, I know that we use, we use some of them as well. We use the GAD, which is the Severity Measure for Generalized Anxiety Disorder. And there's one specific for uh, child age 11 to 17. There's also another common screen that is widely used. It's called the SCARED. And it's a screen for child anxiety related disorders. Okay. 
So something to point out is that clinical evaluation generally includes a combination of questionnaires and assessments. Uh, it includes a diagnostic interview and behavioral observation to determine if an anxiety diagnosis is appropriate and could benefit from treatment. So we're not saying that just because um, someone is struggling with anxiety that they automatically have an anxiety disorder. Um, there's tools and a whole process to diagnose that and to, to assess for it. On this slide is an example of the severity measure for generalized anxiety disorder. And this one is, is specific to the child age 11 to 17. Um, it's a 10 item measure that assesses the severity of anxiety of generalized anxiety disorder in children and adolescents. And this measure was designed to be completed by the child. Um, so it's helpful because each item is asking the child to rate the severity of his or her generalized anxiety disorder during the past seven days. So they get to rate um, these questions based on how they're doing over the past week. Okay, so this slide is talking about uh, different types of anxiety. And there are five main types of anxiety disorders I know there's six on the on the screen. I'll talk about that in a second. But the five big types of anxiety disorders are going to be generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, phobias, and social phobia. Um, so educating oneself and understanding the different types of anxiety is not for you to self-diagnose or diagnose others. Um, on the contrary, by knowing what types of anxiety there is, it's much easier to notice certain symptoms, as we mentioned before, and patterns. And therefore, it's, you know, it, it helps us to, to know when to seek help. And as you can see there, the sixth um, type of anxiety that's listed is post-traumatic stress disorder, because fear and anxiety is a big part of PTSD. So we're gonna to go to the next slide. Sorry, my control okay. is not working. Did it freeze? Yeah. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, so this slide is talking about um, hidden behaviors of someone with social anxiety, which was one of the, the top five anxiety disorders. And it can look like someone saying they're busy when they're too overwhelmed to attend an event. It could be somebody avoiding situations where attention may be put on them. That's just so overwhelming. Um, someone who likes to rehearse responses uh, before going out could be a behavior of someone that struggles with social anxiety or hyper-focusing on others, nonverbal cues as a sign of looking for any signs of disapproval. So this person is very self-conscious um, or it could look like them being overly self-reliant where they are afraid to ask for help. And then they're also very self-critical. Um, so sometimes anxiety is not always, does not always look like how we think. And that was the whole purpose of this slide. Okay. This slide uh, takes a look at anxiety attacks. And I'm sure everybody has an idea of what they think an anxiety attack looks like. Um, it's not just hyperventilating and rocking back and forth. It can actually look like some of the behaviors and uh, characteristics described on this slide where someone may look zoned out or detached. They might be very jumpy and startled and sensitive to loud noises. They may feel numb. They may completely go silent or appear very tense or rigid. and 
they may even have pressured speech because they're just that anxious and overwhelmed. They're not realizing they're speaking that fast and pressured. So how kids with anxiety differ from their peers. Um, they can misinterpret threat and danger. They, you know, anxious kids think a lot. They think too much to the point that academic performance, family functioning, friendships, extracurricular activities are compromised. They can ruminate, perseverate. They can seem indecisive and they may feel, they may come across as perfectionists, but they're struggling. Um, so we treat when anxiety interferes with daily functioning. Okay, so we want to have compassion for these kids. Um, this slide um, does a great job at explaining the vicious cycle of anxiety because that's what can essentially happen. It become it can become a vicious cycle once the anxiety the person starts to feel anxious. It can snowball from there. So what happens is anxious people might try to avoid feeling anxious and escape the distressful experience, right? So if we're gonna apply this to taking that exam, um, they're really anxious and nervous about it and they just want to avoid it. So the essence of anxiety is worrying about this potential threat. Maybe they think they're going to fail or they're not gonna pass or they're not gonna be prepared. So they're trying to cope with that event um, in a way that's somewhat, it's, it's not positive, it's negative, right? It's getting in their way. Um, but they are already thinking that the outcome of the event is going to be negative. That's the point. So they may do this by paying more attention to possible signs of potential threat and, the, and looking internally to see whether um, they're able to cope with it. So when we start to notice these anxious symptoms, they are starting to think that they can't cope with the situation. And that's where they start to feel more anxious and it keeps snowballing. And that's when the anxiety becomes out of control, unmanageable, and then they feel out of control, like there's nothing they can do. So that brings us to the next slide. Um, so we're talking about anxiety and how it can be it can cause so much impairment and really interfere with with our students' lives. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, anxiety disorders can one hundred percent be treated. There's so much treatment out there that's evidence based that can help people to regain a sense of control over their anxiety so that they're able to manage and cope with it and go about what they need to do. So psychoeducation is um, what that entails is learning about anxiety, what causes it, how it causes the feelings in their body. Um, so knowledge is power. That's where psychoeducation can be helpful. Um, there can be behavioral strategies where learning relaxation techniques, exercise, how to how to engage in proper self-care. Um, all of that can help with some of those physical symptoms that come up when we start to feel so anxious and um, out of control. There are cognitive interventions where what helps us is learning about are the patterns of anxious thinking and how to change them. Because sometimes these anxious thoughts that we have may not always be logical or based on in facts, on facts, but we believe them. Um, there's something called graded exposure where it says you're facing the most tolerable portion and gradually increasing to full exposure as you learn to decrease symptoms of anxiety can also be proven to help to help people overcome their fear. Um, parent training, um, teaching parents how to support their child when they're anxious, and then coping skills training. That's gonna look like problem solving skills, assertiveness skills, social skills. All of that stuff is gonna help um, students learn how to navigate everyday problems and stress.
So the next few slides were, are gonna be uh, tips for parents and educators um, on how to address and support kids with anxiety. So we included this slide about stigma because it's important that, you know, I think if we're really going to try to identify and look out for these warning signs and help our students and our children with anxiety, we might need to take a look at if, if we have any stigma, right? So what mental health stigma sounds like is, I don't know if, if we are starting to think they're faking it or we're, we're thinking to themselves, they just need to try and exercise or other people have it a lot worse or can't they just choose to be happy that might those are examples of stigma and that can actually get in the way of trying to to get help and support to the kids um this slide talks about some of the common myths about anxiety um i don't know if we if we should go over all of them, um, they're pretty self-explanatory. The first one, people can't just snap out of, people can just snap out of being anxious. So what we know is that's not true because anxiety can actually change someone's brain where they have an over, they can actually have an overactive stress response where they're thinking they're constantly in a situation, a dangerous situation, or they're perceiving some sort of threat. So they cannot just snap out of it. They need help, they need treatment. Um, it's a myth that anxiety isn't treatable. We know it's 100% treatable. Um, people do overcome it and are able to manage and gain control over it. Um, another myth is people need medication to manage their anxiety. That's not necessarily the case. Medication is just one intervention. And uh, if it is part of the intervention, it can only be, for the most part, if it's combined with other types of treatment, it's only 30% of the intervention. So really, um, medication doesn't always have to be the go-to for treatment when it comes to anxiety. There's so many other types of evidence-based interventions and coping skills. Um, kids aren't anxious, they're just shy, not necessarily true. And children's and teens don't have anxiety, they're just looking for attention. So we talked about how, again, how it can look and show up for kids. Uh, Two is just for our planning purposes, mm -hmm. we reached our 750 benchmark. Okay. Just so you know. Um, so maybe what we'll do is we'll just kind of breeze through the rest of the slides. Um, so why the way, why the way you speak about anxiety matters? So when, if we are going to approach a student or our child about anxiety, we want to try to be mindful about the way we speak to them, right? Um, we want to be compassionate, um, empathetic, and genuinely try to let them know we want to help. Um, if you could switch to the next slide. So we we incorporated some slides of things to say, what not to say to someone with anxiety. Um, you know, so as you can see, like telling a person to calm down, stop worrying, or why are you so anxious? Those are not going to be helpful things to to make someone want to open up and share and tell you what's going on. We also want to try to um, avoid over involvement or anxious, uh, you know, uh, responding with anxious behaviors and reactions, and um, none of that is going to be helpful. The next slide is what to actually say to someone with anxiety, so we can remind them that they're safe, that there's no judgment. Um, we can try to help them put things in perspective, help them find another way of looking at the stressor or the stressful situation. We can validate how they feel, offer help, and what's what can be so helpful is staying calm. The last few slides are going to be tips for parents, and um, it's just going to reinforce some of what we just already talked about. So validating your child's experience, don't minimize or maximize the concerns, really just try to hear them and listen to them. 
um, building daily life skills and teaching our teen how to plan ahead, how to prepare can, can help alleviate anxiety or anxious things that are coming up, uh, setting reasonable expectations and helping our child set manageable goals. Modeling effective coping strategies is a big one. Um, so if, if the child is able to recognize and see how you manage anxiety and stress, that actually goes a long way. So monitoring our own stress level and how we take care of ourselves, that's a way we can model and uh, show our kids, you know, what they can do. Uh, touching base with your child or teen regularly, even if they act like they don't want you to. Just being um, a constant, a constant person letting them know that, you know, I just want to check in or, you know, how are you doing? Even though they may seem like, oh, you're bothering me, they they notice. Um, encourage proper rest and nutrition. Um, and let's try to encourage some non-screen non-screen time activities. Okay. Um, some other ones are putting stressors into perspective. So if you are able to talking with you, maybe talk about facts versus fears. Um, encourage your child or teen to tell you when they're feeling overwhelmed. Sometimes that that can actually open up the communication providing structure, consistent rules, and predictability, working with your child or teen to set up a reasonable schedule, especially if they're involved with a lot of activities, um, working with your child to understand their hopes and dreams. And then last but not least, seek assistance, seek the assistance of a mental health professional or school psychologist or school counselor if stress and anxiety continues to be a concern. And this is a slide um, of some helpful coping strategies that students can use in school. Um, we're gonna give you guys, I think, a copy of this. Okay. Um, these are some other healthy coping mechanisms that they can start to practice right away and they're free. <laughs> um, the next is a video that I don't think we're gonna have time to show, but if you if you do have a moment, um, if you any of you know about mindfulness, it's actually a really beneficial exercise and it's a true coping skill for anxiety. It's a coping skill that works by taking your focus to the present moment and away from your distressful thoughts. So sometimes we just need to take a pause and step back and kind of take a look at, you know, what's going on and take a look at this anxiety and how it's manifesting so that we can start to take action to do something about it. I think someone also, I saw really briefly in the chat about procrastination. Absolutely. Procrastination can, can definitely be related to anxiety where the person is avoiding and putting off a, a daunting, stressful task. Um, the next slide, are we going to show it? No? Okay, it's too long. It's too long. Right, I was trying to change the slides okay, and it just no came on. Uh, let's see. Some of the controls are not working for me the proper way. Okay. Okay, these are some other mindfulness activities. Um, as you can see, belly breathing, color counting, uh, five senses body scan. Those are things that we can actually do anytime, anywhere, any place. Um, so they can be very helpful. Okay. Um, we also included some common and popular mindfulness apps that you can access on your smartphone. A lot of the teens have smartphones now. So there's a uh, Headspace, uh, Calm, Smiling Mind. And a lot of them may have free trials or like a free version, which is nice. So you don't have to even purchase it. And then in the next few slides, we put together a lot of helpful resources for you to reference, such as information about hotlines, support groups, 
readings and local mental health agencies and phone numbers um, for you to, to, to have. And um, I think that's about it. So we went over tons of information. Sure. Thank you, Therese. Yes, I'm going to stop sharing so we can go sure. over some questions. Mm -hmm. Are we going to look in the chat or the Q&A? Yes, in the chat. Yeah, the chat was open. Okay. Um, one of the viewers is asking, um, how would you handle school avoidance caused by an anxiety? I would say that school avoidance is another complex topic. Mm -hmm. And we would need to explore it more. What function does school avoidance or these behaviors serve to the child? Because there are several mm -hmm. that can be behind school avoidance. Yes. Um, any words on teens' procrastination? And you, as you already mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. It could be as well a sign of an anxiety like not wanting to face something that seems to be overwhelming or threatening to them. Mm -hmm. um, another viewer is mentioning that yoga meditations can also be done right. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I... Those are the best practices for managing an anxiety and stress. Um, what about nervousness? I didn't see that in your explanation. Nervousness is mm -hmm. definitely a symptom of anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. And it can show up as nail biting or restlessness or fidgeting, and hence the fidgetoids are everywhere. Um, yeah. Yeah. So nervousness is definitely part of anxiety. Mm -hmm. One of the viewers wanted to know if they could download the presentation. So the yes. presentation slide would be posted on the district website under the category of counseling parent universities. Mm -hmm. Another question from the parent, um, does, um, does tips are the same for autistic teens? So, I'm sorry, what was the question? Um, does tips are tips the same for supporting autistic teens with an anxiety? I think so. I I think the tips that we we shared can be helpful, mm -hmm. um, but that would be an, another different area, right? But um, I think it can be helpful. Absolutely. Another viewer is asking, will the district give students an, an anxiety screener? So... I think uh, this question would be better answered by uh, Dr. Lee McDonald. I do not believe that they screen the entire student's population for an anxiety at this time. Sure, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, sure. I, so we do not give out mm -hmm. mass screeners. I mean, obviously, there we have a lot of different tools in place to... Um, you know, informally screen children, mm -hmm. whether that's relationships they have with their counselors. Mm -hmm. We train our staff on youth mental health first aid to look for signs and symptoms. You as a parent, of course, if you have concerns, you can always come forward with those concerns uh, in a confidential manner. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways, and, and but, uh, you know, we currently do not have a, as do most districts, do not have a, a screener that they give out uh, mm -hmm. for sale per se. Yeah. Thank if you, you if you do have concerns, I guess if you have you're able to um, see your pediatrician. I think pediatricians are a lot of them do have behavioral health screenings. They can mm -hmm. they can do during the visit. Another question from the viewer: How to convince my almost eighteen year old son, who is a senior in high school, that assistance would help him? So how would you convince someone to get help? Yeah, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. I guess first off, making them aware that there are resources and support in the school if mm -hmm. he's interested, right? 
He can sure. start by talking to his school counselor if he has a relationship with them. Absolutely. I think um, any help starts with having a good, honest communication about the issue. Um, I think this question is a little bit complex. Shyness and avoid, uh, it just disappeared. It was a question about shyness. Shyness and avoid putting self viewpoints in the group. Can this be considered a type of stress? How to go about to improve it and make the child feel more confident and comfortable? So I think the viewer is talking about signs of social anxiety when the child uh, feels anxious about presenting in, in front of the group. So some of the strategies would include practicing before presenting in front of a large group, like doing one-on-one -on -one presentation in a safe home environment, then practicing maybe one-on-one -on -one with a peer and then with a teacher. Then another strategy would be practicing deep breathing exercises to re relieve that anxious feeling. Also working with any negative thoughts so having a positive mindset, believing that I can do that. So these are some of the strategies that come in mind. Uh, Lee, could you please um, repeat where the viewers can find the slides for the presentation? There are a few questions about that. Sure. So uh, within a couple of days, uh, we will post not only a video on our district YouTube page, but also the actual presentation with a link to that same video mm -hmm. under the school counseling page. If you go to the district website, you go to departments, school counseling, and then you'll see a link for parent universities as well. And typically what we do is also link uh, the presentations in the school newsletters after the fact. So uh, again, go to the, the departments, school counseling, parent universities. Give us mm -hmm. a couple of days. We'll have it posted there. Sure. And um, there is another question. Are there any resources on how to handle school avoidance due to an anxiety? I believe that in the past year or so, we've done a presentation on school refusal, school avoidance. So you can find some resources posted on the district website. And then you can always uh, reach out to your child school counselor for any additional resources on the topic. I would echo that. There are uh, some resources where you have a, a personal circumstance or concern within your family. Just reach out to, to one of us if, if you need to, and we'll point you in the right direction or your child school counselor. Uh, if they're classified, their case manager as well mm -hmm. uh, can try to you know, work with you to find uh, the guidance that you need. Mm -hmm. And another question, do the teachers inform parents about child's and anxiety attacks that happen in school? I mean, I think that's a hard, uh, you know, black and white answer, right? Obviously, if there are mm -hmm. concerns, um, that's something that we want to work with parents on and make sure that they're aware. You know, the counselor might be the best person who uh, the staff member might go to. Um, you know, our teachers, uh, as great as they are, uh, they're not necessarily mm -hmm. trained uh, as school counselors or counselors in general. Um, but that's, I go back to the kind of the training that we do for our teachers. Mm -hmm. We do uh, want them to be our eyes and ears and, and have a sense for uh, how our kids are doing socially, emotionally, to, to be able to have that conversation with the counselor and then certainly work with the family. Thank you. Thank you. I think we went through most of the questions that I see here in the chat. Um, can we include yoga meditation as part of the curriculum? So there, so are, uh, there are some things that are taught uh, in our health curriculum. Our school counselors also do pushing classroom lessons on healthy coping mechanisms as early as sixth grade. Uh, so there are a fair amount of resources um, and it's hard to kind of capture everything that the school district does. Uh, mm -hmm. But also making sure that we have, you know, inclusive spaces in our classroom and that, you know, children are, you know, we, our teachers understand that, 
you know, it, the social emotional piece is just as important as the academic piece, right? And sometimes that gets lost, certainly, but um, it's something that if you have concerns, by all means, bring bring them forward. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's another question. My child is normal and happy with friends around, but upset and nervous when alone. So I, I think to answer this question, it would be helpful to know the age of the child and also have a conversation with them. What makes them feeling upset and nervous? Do they miss their friends? Are they afraid to be in alone? Do you, they feeling change when you are present with them? So just diving a little deeper into these feelings. I think we covered most of the questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Well, thank you, Therese and Natalia, for your presentations. Excellent. Um, again, reach out to us, parents, if you have questions. Yes. Uh, and you have a, a, something didn't make sense, by all means, um, let us know. Again, Lee McDonald, Deputy Superintendent. You can find my contact information on the district website, or you can reach out to uh, Ms. Smedley, our Director of School Counseling, and we can help you navigate uh, whatever you're uh, uh, dealing with. Uh, have a great night, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.